Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Kristen Rossum. She could have been a scientist, but she chose a different path. Blonde Kristen Rossum, a chemistry graduate from San Diego State University, could have had a brilliant future. Instead, she is serving a life sentence in the Central California Women's Facility for the crime against her husband. Ralph and Constance Rossum had three children and were preparing them for an undoubtedly bright future. The children received education from top schools, were tutored, and participated in clubs and sections for talent development. However, the fragile and impulsive Kristen broke, unable to keep up with the pace in pursuit of the ideal. Lying, skipping classes, and the desire to escape reality first introduced her to a sense of ease and oblivion after consuming alcohol. But soon, alcohol stopped providing the desired effect of tranquility, and she became dependent on the controlled substance methamphetamine. Methamphetamine, meth, is the most addictive illicit substance in the USA. It causes paranoia, clouds judgment, euphoria, and hallucinations. Kristen's erratic behavior and detachment from real life caught her parents' attention. After a long conversation, she admitted that she had been addicted to the substance since high school. This behavior was a severe blow for a family of university-educated professionals. After several months of numerous conflicts with her parents, 17-year-old Kristen secretly ran away to Mexico with friends for a holiday. There, she met a man by chance. Tall, handsome Gregory de Villay, seven years her senior, seemed like an angel who would save her. And he did. Greg fell in love with the bad girl. He took on the role of a parent and responsibility for her well-being. With Greg's support, she managed to get a job at a local forensic department as a toxicology assistant. Her skills impressed the employer. Her addiction was forgotten, which worked in her favor, as her job in toxicology provided access to seized controlled substances. As a forensic assistant, Kristen graduated from university with honors. Her teachers and employer praised her, handing her the Best Student Award, unaware of the reasons for her love of the chosen profession. Her relationship with Greg lasted about five years and ended with a grand wedding on June 5, 1999. Kristen's parents adored Greg and were at ease for their daughter as she had climbed out of the pit of dependency and confidently stood on the road to a promising and happy life. In March 2000, Kristen was hired by the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office as a toxicologist. A toxicologist analyzes body fluids to detect controlled substances, Gregory was working in the biotechnology industry at the time. Kristen quickly grew bored with her monotonous life and began seeking excitement elsewhere. She found an opportunity with a new colleague, Michael Robertson, who had been appointed as the department head. He was married, but that didn't stop a sudden infatuation between them. They couldn't keep their relationship secret for long. Greg found numerous letters exchanged between the secret lovers. The marital relationship deteriorated. But Gregory still hoped to save the marriage, knowing his wife's weaknesses and trying as hard as ever to save her. This time, Kristen didn't want to be saved. She demanded a divorce. On the morning of Monday, November 6, 2000, Kristen was getting ready for work as usual. Greg was ill and stayed home. Kristen was very worried about her husband. In the days following their separation talk, he had been lethargic and unusually calm. She informed his workplace of her husband's illness. She also visited him during her lunch break. Greg was asleep. At 9.22 p.m. that same day, Christine called emergency services to report that her husband Greg was not breathing. He had most likely committed suicide because he was home alone. The woman cried into the phone and did not listen to the dispatcher's instructions to examine the body and possibly administer first aid. Police officers and paramedics arriving on the scene at 10.19 p.m. pronounced Gregory de Villiers dead. He was lying on the bedroom floor with his torso exposed, surrounded by scattered rose petals. The room examination suggested that Greg most likely consumed a lethal dose of several controlled substances. Empty vials of powerful painkillers were scattered around, and torn wedding photos were found on his bed. During the interrogation, Kristen stated that she had informed her husband of their separation the previous evening. Just 17 months after the wedding, she regretted getting married. She felt she had rushed into it, Greg was too clingy, and she wanted to distance herself. 
Greg's death was ruled a suicide. The cause of death was strong, sedative drugs. Kristen signed the cremation papers. However, Gregory's family and friends refused to believe in such a sudden suicide. None of them noticed any changes in his character or mood. He had not shared his marital problems with anyone. Greg was so opposed to controlled substances that he would never have taken them. Soon, the relatives managed to stop the cremation and insisted on an independent autopsy. The family's persistence allowed for the consideration of a homicide scenario. Soon, toxicological tests revealed that Gregory's body contained an extremely high amount of fentanyl, a pain reliever 150 times stronger than morphine, along with lesser amounts of clonazepam and trace amounts of oxycodone, known as hillbilly heroin. Investigators speculated that, under the strong influence of clonazepam and other detected drugs, someone else administered the lethal dose of fentanyl to Gregory. Kristen became the prime suspect, as fentanyl is not an over-the-counter medication, and she had ample knowledge and access to such drugs. Upon arrival for interrogation at the police station, Kristen's emaciated, unattractive appearance and her doping behavior indicated her drug dependency. This was confirmed by her own statements on the day of Gregory's death. Kristen was inconsistent in her accounts. Initially, Kristen told paramedics that Gregory had not taken any medication, but later she changed her statement, suggesting he might have taken oxycodone. At the hospital, Kristen told a nurse that Gregory might have overdosed on oxycodone. Oxycodone is similar in effect to codeine-based drugs. It can not only relieve pain, but also induce a sense of euphoria. It depresses the respiratory center, and without timely assistance, its use can be fatal. The police considered the possibility that Gregory died from an accidental overdose of cold medicine and oxycodone. In conversations with Kristen, they also learned that Gregory was very upset about their failing marriage, leading Kristen to tell the police that he ended his own life. This was another investigative avenue they explored. On November 8th, a colleague of Kristen's, Russ Lowe, called the police. He informed them about Kristen's affair with her boss. This information shifted the course of the police investigation. Evidence of Kristen's connection with her boss, Dr. Robertson, was found. The evidence included passionate emails they exchanged, as well as computer files and professional articles revealing Dr. Robertson's specialized knowledge of fentanyl. The criminal puzzle was coming together perfectly. It was suspected that Gregory became a threat to the lovers, as he knew that Kristen, with her access to the lab and controlled substances, was secretly using them, and Michael was covering for her. It was a premeditated crime. The challenge for the investigators was to prove it. During interrogation, Michael Robertson told detectives that he was aware of his lover's drug dependency. At that time, no charges were brought against the couple. They were both dismissed from their jobs for violating several rules during the investigation. Serious trouble for Kristen began in January, when police raided her home, finding traces of drugs and paraphernalia. She was arrested for the first time, but was later released on bail. The investigation progressed as new information emerged. This included Kristen's diary. During its initial examination, investigators hypothesized that it was written by Kristen not for herself, but for an external reader, as a means of covering up and affirming her innocence while crafting the appearance of Gregory's perfect self-inflicted demise. On the day of her husband's death, she bought a rose and revealing lingerie actions inconsistent with her distressed demeanor. Medical examination indicated that Gregory was unconscious for at least six hours before his passing, and his death could have occurred an hour or an hour and a half before it was confirmed. Additionally, a bruise around a needle injection site on the young man's arm was found, its purpose and executor unexplained. At Kristen's workplace, a shortage of the drug that led to Gregory's demise, as well as other controlled substances, was discovered. Police believed Kristen poisoned Gregory, administering fentanyl without his knowledge. The prosecution built its case on toxicological and medical data. With enough circumstantial evidence, Christine was arrested on June 25, 2001, and charged with first-degree murder. After spending six months in custody, she was released on bail. The first trial soon commenced. The prosecution's main theory was the motive for the homicide. They argued that she terminated Gregory 
because he threatened to tarnish her good girl reputation by revealing her renewed drug use and affair with Michael Robertson. The prosecution claimed Kristen poisoned Gregory with fentanyl. The court heard that fentanyl is a powerful synthetic opioid, 80 times stronger than morphine. It was suggested that she first tried to end his life with clonazepam, but when that failed, she administered fentanyl. They also argued that she then staged the bedroom to look like Gregory ended his own life, tearing pages from her diary and placing rose petals and a wedding photo around his body. The court heard that Kristen, with a degree in biochemistry, used her knowledge of drugs and chemistry to terminate Gregory. The prosecution also claimed that Kristen hoped to convince her colleagues in the medical examiner's office that Gregory's death was self-inflicted, hiding information about the fentanyl. However, before Gregory's autopsy could be conducted, she was transferred to another lab, and the attempt to substitute toxicological research was unsuccessful. The prosecution presented Kristen's day on November 6th. Early in the morning, she called Gregory's employer to report his absence, then went to work. Her colleagues testified that about an hour after she arrived at work, around 9 a.m., she was seen crying in Michael's office. The apartment building manager, where Kristen and Gregory lived, reported seeing her return home at 12.10 p.m. At 12.41 p.m., she went to a local grocery store and purchased several items, including a single red rose. Credit card statements confirm this fact. Hours before Gregory's demise, she made multiple calls to Michael. Dr. Brian Blackburn, the San Diego County medical examiner who conducted Gregory's autopsy, testified that Gregory had been deceased for at least an hour before the paramedics arrived. He informed the court that Gregory developed early bronchopneumonia. This condition arises when secretions, normally expelled through breathing, accumulate in the lungs because a person is either unconscious or not breathing deeply enough. Dr. Blackburn also informed the court that Gregory's bladder contained a significant amount of urine, which would have been very uncomfortable had he been conscious. This led Dr. Blackburn to conclude that Gregory was breathing poorly for approximately 6 to 12 hours before his death. A person in an unconscious state would not be able to sprinkle rose petals over themselves. Dr. Blackburn showed that the level of clonazepam found in Gregory's blood was not at an overdose level and was not lethal. Dr. Theodore Stanley testified on behalf of the prosecution. He demonstrated that fentanyl is a potent and fast-acting pain reliever with a serious side effect that can lead to a person's respiratory arrest. Dr. Stanley stated that the speed at which fentanyl begins to act depends on the method of its administration. The peak effect occurs about 16 hours after applying a transdermal patch, 20 to 30 minutes after oral ingestion, 15 to 20 minutes after intramuscular injection, and within five minutes after intravenous injection. Dr. Stanley informed the court that fentanyl is usually not administered orally because the liver destroys about 65% of it, so only 35% enters the bloodstream. When asked to explain how fentanyl entered Gregory's system, neither Dr. Blackburn nor Dr. Stanley could provide a definitive opinion. Dr. Stanley showed that various concentration levels in Gregory's body, along with data indicating that Gregory was unconscious and breathing shallowly for several hours before his death, suggest that fentanyl was likely administered to Gregory multiple times. The prosecution could not confidently tell the jury how Kristen poisoned Gregory, but there were indications that she might have applied fentanyl patches to his arm while he was asleep. The disappearance of 15 patches from the laboratory where Kristen formerly worked supported this theory as a possibility. The defense asserted Kristen's innocence, acknowledging that fentanyl was the cause of Gregory's death, but claimed he self-administered it, intentionally causing his own demise due to despair over family issues. Kristen testified in court, describing waking up on the morning of November 6th to find Gregory distraught. She called his employer at 7.42 a.m. to report his illness and that he wouldn't be coming to work. She told the court she went to work but returned to the apartment to check on Gregory, having lunch with him after noon. Christine's testimony. I asked Gregory why he was so upset that morning. He replied that he wasn't feeling well and had taken some oxycodone and clonazepam. He planned to stay home and sleep. I left for work. Around 2.30 in the afternoon during my lunch break, I came home to check on Gregory. We had lunch. I then went back to work. I got home around 8 o'clock in the evening. Gregory was lying on the bed. I thought he was asleep. I took a bath. 
When I came out, I tried to wake him up. He was cold. I called the emergency services. The prosecutor cross-examined Kristen, calling her explanation strange. She admitted to lying in the past and about her drug use. He told the court that fentanyl was the perfect poison because it's hard to detect, which she knew well from her job. Medical testimony, based on autopsy and toxicological findings, proved that Gregory was unconscious for about six, eight hours, meaning Kristen couldn't have had lunch with her husband that day. The defense claimed that although Dr. Blackburn showed the clonazepam level in Gregory's blood wasn't lethal, taking oxycodone, an opioid, and clonazepam, a benzodiazepine, together could create a synergistic effect, making them more potent. They suggested Gregory might have unknowingly taken the drugs himself. How fentanyl was administered and why high levels were found in his system remained unexplained. After eight hours of deliberation, the jury found Kristen guilty of first-degree homicide and special circumstances homicide due to the use of poison. She was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Kristen maintained her innocence and appealed the verdict. The appellate court heard that errors were made by her own defense team. Her lawyers admitted fentanyl caused the death, but failed to test autopsy samples for fentanyl metabolites. This test could have determined whether Gregory swallowed fentanyl, or if the fentanyl found in the samples was a result of laboratory contamination after his death. If fentanyl had been detected only in the samples, and never in Gregory's body, the prosecution's theory that fentanyl caused his death would have been incorrect. The appellate court heard that there was a break in the chain of custody regarding the samples. They were placed in a cardboard box, with each container marked as a sample from Gregory's body, but the containers weren't sealed. They were supposed to be delivered to the sheriff's office for immediate transfer to an external lab, but the person supposed to receive the samples was absent, so the box remained at the medical examiner's office for about 36 hours before being delivered to the sheriff's forensic lab. The appellate court's argument was that anyone with a key to the medical examiner's office building had access to the samples. Fentanyl could have been added to the samples posthumously. Kristen believed there was a motive to tamper with the samples and frame her for the crime due to various personal relationships and tensions among the staff. Indeed, Kristen argued in the appellate court that on November 8, 2000, Michael informed one of the toxicologists that he had examined a sample of Gregory's stomach contents. The three-judge panel of the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals concluded that Kristen's lawyers erred in not contesting the prosecution's claim that her husband died from a fentanyl overdose. They stated that her legal team should have tested the autopsy samples for fentanyl metabolites, rather than just admitting he died in such a manner. However, they did not overturn the verdict, but sent the case back to federal court to determine if this defense error could have altered the trial's outcome. After this decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that federal courts must adhere to the state court's decision when considering such appeals. Based on this ruling, the appellate court voted against holding a hearing on Kristen's case. Her appeal was denied, and she remains in custody. Michael Robertson was implicated as an accomplice in Kristen's trial. Authorities discreetly filed a criminal conspiracy complaint and issued a sealed warrant for the arrest of Michael Robertson the former boss and lover of convicted perpetrator Kristen Rossum. Robertson, who lives freely and works as a forensic toxicology consultant in Australia since Rossum's husband's demise in 2000, could be arrested and held on $100,000 bail if he ever returns to the United States. Gregory's family filed a lawsuit accusing the county of negligence that allowed Kristen to steal a lethal dose of drugs from the medical examiner's office undetected. In 2006, a U.S. court awarded them $147 million in civil damages. In a case that continues to captivate the nation, Rossum, a former toxicologist at the county medical examiner's office, was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole in February 2003 for stealing drugs from the lab and using them to poison her husband, Gregory de Villers, staging a suicide scene in their apartment, scattering his body with red rose petals. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.